Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we're two industrial designers in the big city sweating the small stuff. Ooh. James, I'm sorry. I gotta I gotta get this thing off my chest off my chest because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really excited. I went to the Apple event today and yeah. I saw Sir Jonathan Ive. Ooh. With those with your Johnny eyes? With my Johnny eyes. I saw him across the room and boy oh boy did he look beautiful. I just <laughs> I just couldn't help myself. Did my he... heart was racing and <laughs> <laughs> Did he look as good as a FaceTime camera on an iPhone 10X? Uh, he looked better yes. in real person. Oh my so gosh. much definition. I don't I can't even imagine. Oh man. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I just am kind of coming off the high from that. Well, I mean, uh explain a little bit of the backstory mm, mm-hmm. behind your encounter, Nick. Yeah, yeah, I'll, what, I'll I'll rewind it a little bit. Where was this? Um at just, a Russian bath? I just had a uh, oh, okay. Um well, I was invited by Procreate to go to the Apple event here in New York where they announced the new iPad and the new MacBook Air and the new Mac Mini. So that in itself was awesome. Um, but yeah, I mainly went there just to see Johnny. And I really tried to meet him. Um, and he had like five bodyguards surrounding him the whole time. <laughs> like I tried to walk through and like walk up the gate and people were stopping me. They were like, Nick, you can't come through. They knew my name. What? <laughs> I'm just kidding. They didn't oh know my, my name. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Did you have a name tag on? Did no, no, they just had like little tag. Like, there there were tags, but not. It didn't say my name. Was there a Procreate section of the Apple event? Ah, uh, like, no. All of you Procreators, I thought come there over here. I thought there would be like assigned seats, but it was just kind of free for all. Really? There was assigned seats in the front. That's where Johnny was sitting. You should. Oh, I was gonna say you could have just walked up and and to the person next to him and say, "Is this seat taken?" <laughs> well. Let me let me kind of break it down for you, because, you know... Break it down, Nick. A couple... I mean, this was what? Back at Square One, that was like episode 20 or something. We had uh, Hector Silva on mm-hmm. the podcast, and yeah. he told the story about when he saw Johnny Ive, like, outside of a bar. Oh, yeah. And now I understand the whole story. Like, now I'm on Hector's side. We were making <laughs> fun of him. I, I totally get it now. Like, my heart was racing. And I sat there after the whole head, the whole show had ended. I sat there for like an hour waiting for Johnny to come up the up the aisle. Right. Um, but he never came. I no, saw him. I, he was on stage. There's got to be a back door. Yeah, he was on stage, and then he went behind stage, and I thought, oh, this is the chance. This is when he's going to walk through. And he didn't walk through. And I was like, where'd he go? Yeah. He disappeared. And so, like, I went out to the lobby, and I stood in the lobby for another half hour waiting oh for him to come down. I thought maybe, thought maybe the elevator doors would open, and then... <laughs> I would see him, um, and no, I, he didn't come out the elevator, and then I decided to walk around back. <laughs> now, you know, I mean, I didn't, like, walk into, like, a restricted area, but I walked, like, close to the, the back gate, mm. and I heard the security guards, like, talking on the microphone, and they said, all right, Gotham needs their first uh, uh, escort, and the other guy was like, who is it? And, and the guy was like, it's the big 200 what so, so cryptic apple is so cryptic there was like so many people there like le- like every five feet there's a person there that is like pointing you in the right direction like if you look like you were lost you could like or or if you were up to no good like they would like just swarm and just, yeah hey, what do, you th- do you need help what are you going what are you doing what do you think jonathan ives name code name is the big uh, 200 i mean uh, come on. poison ivy is coming out <laughs> i i like to imagine it was the big 200 because that's why you heard I mean, think about him. Like, he probably is around 200 pounds, I would say. <laughs> and he's big, like the big 200, right? <laughs> I don't know. I, I haven't sized him up. I mean, every year he gets he gets slimmer, you know, by millimeters. Um, and he can... He's no, so, I think he's getting a little bigger, actually. You think so? I think all the... You think he's the, the MacBook inflated air? All the, all the millimeters that he takes out of the product are added onto him. <laughs> I'm oh sorry. my I'm sorry, gosh, man. that's amazing! Oh man, but I, I am super uh, grateful that Procreate like invited me. This was an amazing opportunity, and it was really cool to actually sit in on one of these keynotes. You know, I've watched it many times on the computer, right? Um, and I don't know if you had a chance to like browse through Apple's new releases or whatnot, but the new iPad Pro came out, and I gotta say, it's like it's a game changer. It seems like one of the most recent magical products that Apple has, I would say since the AirPod. Wow. Or the AirPods came out. Amazing. 
Now, tell us a bit more. I, well, the iPad Pro now doesn't have the button, just has Face ID. The screen goes edge to edge, pretty much. Um, so it's smaller, and it's the same size as a piece of paper. So now you have, like, literally a sketchbook, infinite piece of paper, you know. Um, well, let, mm. <laughs> Okay, James, hold your critique, because... <sighs> We have. We, I'm just excited, man. I just came back from this thing. And yeah, I, just, I know. Uh, I don't want to burst your bubble. Okay, the Apple Pencil also is new. Um, it doesn't have that little cap that everyone loses anymore, and oh. it doesn't charge like a, a penis sticking out of the iPad. <laughs> you know how that? Oh, thank that, God. <laughs> the old iPad. Yeah, that was a weird scenario. Yeah. Um, the new Apple Pencil simply is magnetic to the side, which is beautiful. It's amazing. And it charges through that magnetism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, and then the iPad edges are now squared off like the iPhone 4 was. Right. Um, we have the Volcano camera. It's back. Um, Keep you know, going. You know, it, I'm not sure if that was a sigh of like, it's good or a sigh of, oh, Nick, you need to shut up about Apple. No, 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 no. Keep going. I will say the most impressive thing about the whole event was that Apple announced their 100% they're using 100% recycled aluminum on the new MacBook Air and the new Mac Mini, which is which is amazing. It's like the first step that I, I've really seen anyone take in sustainability that is that substantial. Right. And what they're doing is, you know, Apple mills out all of their products out of solid blocks of aluminum or aluminum, as Johnny would say. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that that's a lot of wasted aluminum, just shavings being you know trash yeah i'm sure i'm sure that they're recouped for other projects but this is the first time that all those shavings from like the new ipad pro you know the the new iphone all those extra shavings of aluminum are being reused melted down and put into those secondary products like the macbook air and the mac mini now see that's the part about apple that i'm currently loving the most right. is and, the optimization of the manufacturing and people like almost gave a standing ovation when they announced that like they clapped for like a good solid three minutes <laughs> it was it was like i the felt base. it yeah. i felt it in my apartment in brooklyn <laughs> it was a I could feel yeah i could feel the clapping um now Oh, sorry, I just it was. I mean, exciting. it's it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Now my criticisms. Yeah, well, let's <laughs> critique it, James. Okay, get the yin and yang in here. Uh, volcano, hate it. Don't want a volcano on my iPad. Okay, okay. Tell me why. I, tell me why I want a volcano he, on my iPad. The and for those of you who aren't familiar with a volcano, it's when the camera bump comes out, and then instead of having just an extrusion, it has a fillet down there, that inside edge. So you get kind of this curved volcano camera look. That's what I've named it. And, you know, they had it in, I believe, the 7? iPhone 7 had it? Mm. Or is it iPhone 6? I think it started started with the 6. Okay, I think it was 6, yeah. Um, But, I mean, yes, the bump itself, the camera bump itself is obtrusive, and no one wants the camera bump. But I think that... If you have to have a bump, the volcano is uh, the most aesthetic, right. most pleasing way to do it. Right. The, it. Your critique is that it shouldn't have a bump. My my critique is usability. Because how often do you lay your iPad down on the aluminum yeah. side? I'm a little worried about that, too. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I, I had the same thought when the iPhone 6 came out. Obviously, a lot of the time it spends in my pocket. And I think... Um, I don't know. I, I I don't. It doesn't really affect me that much. But with the iPad, I feel like it's more of a pain point, right? Because it is such a, you know, it's supposed to be the piece of paper. You know, it's the equivalent of the notebook. Right. It should sit flat. It should sit flat. And and then so the other thing that I was kind of upset about was that I didn't feel like this was a sufficient edge to edge compared to the iPhone. Mm. Even even with the you know, even with the notch, when you're when you're talking about edge to edge with John, the iPhone. Johnny can't win with you, James. Can't no, he? he can't. Um you know, uh Johnny like, John, like Johnny was listening to a podcast. You were complaining <laughs> about the notch and he was like, you know what? 
on the iPad, I'm not going to put a notch, James. I'll just make it a little bit smaller and yeah. keep everything seamless. And it, now you're critiquing him again. I know. I know. He, uh, I'm sorry, Johnny. Um, I, I still really like it. I still really like the aesthetic of it. I like the, the flat sides, the flat edges, because there is something kind of inconvenient with the edges of the iPad Pro that we both own. Like with that tapering edge, right. it's not a great grip. It's kind of like that knife edge, yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I think the square edge is the way to go. I think it'd be cool if they went back to this for the iPhone. Mm, that would be honestly, cool. but mm-hmm. um, but anyway, that those are my major critiques. I also want to give a shout out to uh, when I saw the Apple Pencil and the um, the cut that they have on that. Right. I immediately thought of. Um, R. Leiden did a board for Google. Oh. Um, and it has it has pens that have that same cut. I mean, they're much thicker. They're supposed right. to represent like dry erase markers. I think I've seen that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But uh, but anyway, I mean, it's such a, you know, it's it's kind of one of those low hanging fruit answers to the problem of how do you create a flat edge? Like that's kind of just what comes about right. as you do that. And you're not going to want to make the pencil some odd shape right? Um, yeah, I th- for that edge. The pencil looks really cool now that it has that cut and, you know, it gives it a little bit more of a iconic look, I think. Yeah. And distinctive. I also, you can't really notice on the pictures, I got to play with it and the new pencil has a more of a satin finish to it. Mm. which I liked a lot better over the gloss finish of the old pencil. Mm. Um, and then uh, with the edge, it also acts as a button. So if you press down on the flat side, it um, it can switch different gestures and things. So like instead of having to click a icon on the screen for a race, you can just double tap your pencil and erase. Gotcha. That's cool. So yeah, I mean, lots of great stuff for the new iPad. It's, I mean, again, it's like a huge leap. And it, it's like one of those products that, you know, I have the latest iPad, and I bought it like less than a year ago. But I'm really tempted <laughs> to buy this one. I know it's hard to justify though, because I had I've only had this one for like ten months. I know, but uh, I don't know. I could, I could sell it. You could you could sell it for above market value because of that Nick Baker cachet. You put your fingers <laughs> you all so? over that bad you boy. So? Oh gosh, <laughs> I, that's some, if someone was buying it because they put their because I put my fingers on it, I don't know if I yeah. Could feel good about it. i'm buying it because of that reason oh, no. but uh but anyway i mean now you can you can give it back in and they'll recycle everything hopefully someday yeah yeah i you mean know? i could do that um but that's i don't know that's that's awesome i i have to say nick that while the event was going on i mean i couldn't i was going to a dentist appointment <laughs> today <laughs> Um, and so what I was doing was I couldn't really watch it live because right. I was going in and out of service on the subway, but I was refreshing my iPhone to get your stories nice. to nice. Uh, to see what was happening. Um, but I did see the unveiling of the iPad, so I was I was pretty excited about that, yeah. I have to say. Um, what, what have you been up to this week? I mean, you were on vacation again, which is <laughs> which is fine. It was a good reason. I was, it was my one year wedding anniversary. Congrats, man. My lovely wife, Congrats. Allison, and I went up to Hudson, New York. Uh, beautiful town. Um, I highly recommend it if you live in the New York area. It was our first foray out of the city, really, to, you know, to like take a train and go to one of these outside, you know, towns. Um, I bet it's beautiful up there. It is beautiful. The tr- and the colors are training, changing? Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, it was raining on Saturday, which was kind of our big day to to like hang out and explore. But we actually got quite a lot of time on Sunday. And there's some like really... I mean, I feel like a lot of these outer towns um, from like kind of emanating from New York City, they get a lot of transplants from the city yeah yeah so there are a lot of people like interior designers or just you know product designers whatever there's a lot of cool shops up there there's great food like great restaurants 
Um, it was great. It was, it's, I definitely understand why people seek out these types of towns to recharge from city life. Right. Well, did, isn't Reed looking at land up there somewhere? Oh yeah. He's, well, he's already bought, he's already um, bought land. All um, of upstate, upstate New York. Oh, all of, oh co- of course he's the king. The <laughs> yes. Lord. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I pay homage to his, his, uh, his Royal Highness for allowing us to, uh, trespass on his lands. To enjoy our one year anniversary, um, but yeah, it was great, James. You texted me the other day, and you're like, "Hey, Nick, guess who I just got off the phone with?" <laughs> and I don't know. I gave some answer. I, I said Johnny Ive, just for, for for the heck of it. And he and then James was like, "No, your mom." And I was like, "Oh, good one, James." Yeah, like, right. You're joking. You're like you know the the old your mom joke. And then James is like, "No, really." <laughs> and I'm like, hey, "What?" You called yeah. my mom? Yeah. Or my mom called you? Your your mom uh, messaged me on Instagram <laughs> and uh, very, very nicely said, uh, you know, uh, your family is coming up for Christmas. They are. Mm-hmm. And uh, they would love the opportunity to to meet me and my wife. Um, <laughs> and so, and to give her a call. With my own family. It, Listen, I, I go out to all these events. I <laughs> hang out with these students. They're like, hey, I listen to the podcast. I really like James. I'm like, great. You know, he's a good guy. <laughs> now my mom, what oh, is gosh. going on? Uh, no, I, you know, and, and so I was like, you know what? I'll give her a call right now because I didn't have anything better to do at the time. Um, but your mom is one of the nicest people I've ever spoken to very nice, very complimentary of of you, of me, of the podcast. It was it was like the best uh, like Zoloft I've ever taken mm. was talking to your mom. <laughs> well, that, um, that's good, James. But yeah, so it was it was really great. But while I was talking to your mom, I was like, I haven't called, I haven't talked to my mom in like three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I so I immediately <laughs> called my parents afterward and then caught up with them. That's so, good. But yeah, you got everyone's parents on the book then. Yeah, yeah. But nice. we're gonna have to have your mom as a guest on the podcast. Someday. You think so? Oh, oh wow. yeah, yeah. I want to hear because it's always so interesting to hear out. You know, the outside the perspective. outside perspective, and we get so much of the inside perspective, and you know, we we drool over things, and that's a that's a good idea. You know, I think I think we need, you know, every so often we need some outsiders. We've, you know, guys, we should uh, also reference recently we we've been doing a lot of interviews. Yeah. And those are going to be released over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we want to space them out. Um, but the first one we uh, posted was with um, Kelly Custer of Knack. And that was great. Yeah, it was a wonderful interview. And, you know, go back and listen to it if you haven't already. But. Yeah, solid, uh, solid info. Like Kelly gave some great tips and things. Yeah. Who else? Who else do we have slated? Can we talk? We've we got tease him. We've got Paul Sohi. Right. From Autodesk. He's uh he's uh he's got that AI. He's working that AI that angle. Generative design. He yeah. has those machines learning. They're doing everything. Yeah, it's it was an awesome interview. And then um, while I was away, you interviewed Mister. Mike, yeah, De Tulo. Michael De Tulo, and boy, oh boy, that was I. So much gold in that podcast that I had to split it up in two episodes. Yeah, he like talked about how he just was hanging out with Michael Jordan, and like, <laughs> no, no, there's some like, yeah, there's some just like gold stories in in these upcoming episodes. So stay tuned. We'll we'll post them. Um, yeah, and hopefully soon. I'm sure it'll be within the month or two right so and the most exciting part about that is that we're going to be able to post now on oh spotify we're on spotify now guys finally nick how'd you do it i was well i i didn't do anything spotify just updated their uh (laughs) their submission platform (laughs) no i i had i you mean they lowered their standards (laughs) yeah pretty much pretty much um yeah i was just checking online just I check online pretty much every other week to see if I can get the podcast on Spotify. And, you know, it just so happens that October was the month that they decided to update their parameters. So. Nice. Rocktober. Yeah. Sweet. Um, 
and we got like already 30 followers on spotify so really yeah go follow on spotify i think yeah. that's the thing to do um yeah uh but yeah we had all these interviews mainly because we had we just went to the core saving seven conference yeah um that was last week and you know it was a wealth of information so we wanted to kind of recap what we learned some really mm-hmm. interesting insights we thought were fun um and kind of share share it with you guys because it was just so good that it, i don't know we just had so many like interesting interesting people come through and talk about their design yeah yeah it was a really inspiring conference and and i love like there were a lot of parts about it that i really liked i i thought the branding for it was really awesome yes like i loved all the attention to detail and like the magnetic name tags and uh like the you know the gift bags that we all got the gift totes i actually used my gift tote for on my honeymoon to carry uh, a pair of shoes oh nice uh so immediate immediate utility um but yeah i mean you know walking in on like at first into the main space and uh a saxophone player serenading (laughs) us that Uh, was great wasn't it yeah it was pretty sweet oh man but uh, yeah, we you know I love the way that it that it split up the day because it was just a one day event, but there was a lot going on. Yeah. Um. But it wasn't you know at the same time it wasn't overwhelming, but the fact that we had we all had shared speakers in the morning, mm-hmm. and then split off into you know uh, workshops that we had selected prior to in the afternoon. Yeah, I really. I really enjoyed that setup because one, you did, you felt like it was more of cohesive, a more cohesive conference. Like you, everyone kind of got to know the same thing, but also two, you also got to select, you know, it wasn't 20 people that you had to select from. It was only like three workshops and you got to select one of those three. And usually since there's only three choices, you could select the one that was like very, you know, pointed to where you were trying to go with your career. And and just to kind of preface this, for those who weren't uh, aware of the conference, the Course Saving 7 conference this year was all about starting your own creative career, being more entrepreneurial, kind of breaking out from the corporate, corporate atmosphere and, you know, starting your own business or kickstarting your product. Yeah. Um, so we had like a lot of really interesting like business design entrepreneurs do talks there. And yeah, I mean, you know, the first one, I believe, was Hawrath, mm-hmm. which was a um, – they're like a web design consultancy studio, I think, in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, Four-person team. I, You know, their talk was interesting, I thought, because they really laid out, like, their literal numbers on the screen in front of 200 people, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. Like, they showed their, their – like – you know profits from the first three years and like the first year they only made like twenty thousand dollars and the second year they made a hundred thousand and then this year i think they're slated to make one million dollars yeah which is crazy yeah but it's also nice to be able to have that benchmark of like oh you know here's what people are pricing their projects here is you know what clients they're working with and how they've grown their business um yeah i mean i i I really like their honesty and just bluntness about like being able to track your finances and be transparent about it. Right. Um, Oh, and the one thing that they also did that I thought was really good is like, if you are working with clients and you finish up a project, send them a um, like feedback Google doc or Mm, feedback form. Right. I thought that was a really good tip because it's, it's hard to, you know, get, really critical feedback out of a client during the process but afterwards when they've done the project you can really get that feedback to improve your business that you that you want yeah no that was a really interesting point i i have to say i feel like we're living in the age of transparency you know it it seems to be something that's that's more and more common oh especially with like social media and things like that and i think i haven't I mean, obviously, I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think about like where I see there being drawbacks to transparency, especially when you're sharing things like numbers and things like that. I, I kind of feel like 
there's there's just endless benefits to being transparent. Um, but but I don't know. I I could see there being a threshold of oversharing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think that. I, I don't think that we have to be a community that's at odds with each other. I think that we can really help each other through transparency. And, and you know, it's not like, I don't know. How do you feel about it, Nick? I, I think that's a good point, James. I think um, for sure it feels like being transparent, especially about numbers and salaries and things like that, is helpful to the community. I think the drawbacks come into play when, you know, you take it too personally or you look at someone else's salary and you think, oh, well, I'm better designer than they are and why is this happening and blah, blah, blah. Right. And, it, you know, there's so many factors that play into how much people are pay, get paid and how much you can price yourself that it's really hard to compare in that way, but it's still, it's still important to know what other people are making because you can, you know, you, you can compare – in a way that's not a, being a detriment to your own mental health, if right. that makes sense. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a tough situation, and I, I think we're we're moving towards a better a better community in that aspect. I think I think more people are getting on board of being open, and um, and also, like you said, it's like we're not really in competition with each other. Like, there's plenty of work to go around if you are in the field and you're good at what you do. Like, you don't have to feel like you're fighting each other for a job. Right. And I, I kind of have this this theory about how being, like, open and honest and also just, like, very, very specific about, like, what it is that you're good at actually creates better opportunities for, you know, collaboration within the community of being, like, you know, I, I, I take on a job and there's parts of it that... I know somebody else in the community could do much better and I can reach out to that person and then incorporate them into that job. And, and I think that there, there is plenty of work to go around and by having this knowledge of where people's skill sets are is, is just better for that, for facilitating that type of collaboration. Yeah, I definitely agree. But Um, anyway, (laughs) I digress. No, no, this is good. This is good. This is what, this is what the conference is about, and right. it's really good. Um, I think another one of the morning talks I really enjoyed, and you know, you can speak to this more if you had other thoughts, but I really like Jamie Wolfon's talk mm. about backwards design. Mm-hmm. Um, and Jamie Wolfon is the founder of Good Thing, and he Good Thing makes like everyday houseware products that are you know thoughtfully considered, but also economical and affordably priced. Right, uh, very democratic design, and his his entire design philosophy was I, it's backwards it's backwards design it's almost uh i almost thought it was uprooting the entire design process itself um mm. mm-hmm. and you know I'll, I'll briefly kind of frame it the way he talks about backwards design is that instead of thinking about a product say you want to design a toaster mm-hmm. and so you sit down, you research what's the best toaster. You know, you figure out who who needs their toast toasted. <laughs> <laughs> you start sketching up all these amazing toasters. Some are made out of aluminum, you know, plastic shell body. Maybe you do a crazy one out of terracotta. Who knows? Um, and then you finalize your design. You have this beautiful toaster that you've sketched up, you've catted, you've prototyped. This is the final toaster design. You've done all your research. This is the best toaster you've ever designed. All right, now let's go manufacture it. So then you take it all these manufacturers and you try to get them to say, oh, well, that aluminum piece can never be made. Why did, that doesn't work. How are you going to put the heating element in that? That's not going to work like that. And the design starts to get adjusted and kind of convoluted in a way um, that you really didn't intend. Mm-hmm. So you end up with like a subpar design at the end. Right. That's kind of the normal design process. But Jamie's whole talk was about going from the back end forward. Right. He was like, okay, I'm just going to go to Japan or China or Korea or wherever and tour factories. Yeah. I'm just going to say, oh, hey, there's a cool terracotta factory right down the street. I'm going to go check them out. 
and kind of understand their capabilities and understand the material and understand you know the science behind the material, how the material functions, um, or how the process works of you know making terracotta, and you know see how it can be applied to an actual product. And you go down the list and you realize that terracotta is a great absorb; it greatly absorbs water, mm-hmm. um, so it'd be perfect for an umbrella stand. Mm-hmm. And so that's how they made one of their products was an umbrella stand made out of terracotta. Yeah. And so, like, the design was the last step of the process, which was really interesting. It is interesting. I think that I think that it kind of makes sense for a lot of, like, when we're talking about starting a creative business, it, it does kind of make sense for that type of designer to approach their first design in this way. Yeah. Like, when you were doing your Ben Mirror, mm. like weren't you thinking materially first yeah definitely Uh, i think that it makes sense because your resources of like getting something more complicated made and mass produced in a way that's that has great quality is just more difficult because you're a smaller business yeah Uh, like the part of it that i kind of I don't know that I took offense to it, but he he really went after kitsch design. Oh, yeah, he did. And I mean, by the end of it, he was kind of like, well, you can the rules aren't so rigid. Right. You know, the the uh, the Frank tray that well, they do. Uh, the, Jamie had these two rules. Let me see if I can. Oh, yeah. His, his two rules of bad design. He said here he had like studied the market and he came up with these rules and he said, here are the things that make designs bad. Things shaped like other things. Mm-hmm. So your classic uh, kitchen spoon that's shaped like an alligator or your, uh, you know, I don't know, toilet brush that's shaped like a flower. That's a cream machine one, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's uh, uh, Stefano Giovanni. <laughs> the, these things are what make bad design. And then the other rule was no text on objects. So you think about every tourist shop that you walk into has, you know, every every shirt and mug that says grand canyon or uh i went to the grand canyon and all i got with this was this lousy t-shirt you know <laughs> i i think that and, and you know so by the end he talked about the frank tray which is uh a like a bent metal tray that or a formed metal tray that looks like um one of those hot dog paper hot dog containers. right right so he broke his own rule it's shaped yes. like another thing so yeah, I, I think that from the, from the start when he laid out those rules, I was immediately you got like, mad. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Because I think that too often kitsch design is tossed aside as being cheap. And I think that that is totally backwards. Yeah. I, um, I think that there's plenty of examples like Alessi of, of, of places that do what's referred to as kitsch in a, in a way that's manufactured well and you know yeah manufactured with quality standards and and when we talk about kitsch design are we really thinking like we're thinking like novelty products that you find in maybe a a gift shop or like a museum gift shop that kind of thing yeah so so here's here's the way that i think of it is like you're growing up before you ever go to design school and you're you're loving the kitsch design you're loving your batman action figures oh yeah you're loving, you know, whatever it is. Disney like, World hat, yeah, you know. Yeah, your yeah. stickers, your your T-shirts that say things. Then you go to design school, and they beat it mercilessly out of you. Uh, and then, you know, you come out the other end, and you're thinking, like, oh, yeah, I understand why that's the case. And, you know, like, it seems, like, superfluous and whatever. But, But I think that there is a point that you reach where you're like, you know, People relate to things and objects that they're familiar with. Right. I mean, you know, it's just the way that the human psyche responds to objects is like they respond favorably to things that they have favorable memories of. Yeah. I think, well, this can kind of dive down into a whole other topic. And we need to still cover this topic of kind of our personal design philosophy. Right. I know you have kind of some feelings about certain elements and things. I have some feelings about familiarity. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a way to implement familiar elements into design. Um, and a lot of times that can be kitsch, but it also, there's ways to make it look nice and still be fun and relatable and familiar. Right. right. But, um, but I, but overall, you know, I thought that the, the process that he discussed was, was really interesting and inspiring and like something that I think is a valuable exercise for any designer to go through is to just like think about really think about the process first and then how you would derive a product from that yeah rather than pushing the process to create the product yeah um but it was yeah. good it was good it was very good um yeah and there was a few other talks that were great as well um i mean those were my favorite it's the ha raf and jamie's talk um mm-hmm. and then we had workshops in the afternoon right and did you had a few? I mean, you had different ones than I did. Yeah. So we each had two. My my first one was with Creighton Berman. So he, you know, he founded um, Manual. We've shouted him out. Before, yeah, right? we've we've definitely shouted him out before. But um, but Manual uh, is a really great brand that he started. He's kickstarted all of his projects on on Manual. And Every one. I think all of them have been successfully funded. And it's all about living slow it's all about the manual lifestyle it's all like it's about coffee what uh, what else do he has uh, uh cocktails got, yeah coffee cocktails he's got a stool that he just launched he's got um a bottle opener um you know he very much uses local manufacturers and you know his i would say that his a lot of his products are very process pure like you know i think jamie would very much approve of right of what creighton has done um he, but, he was a cool guy. I, I got to speak to him with a little, a little bit just yeah. during the during the conference. But yeah, he's a, he's a big proponent of Kickstarter. Um, you know, he got his start there. He was one of the first people to to put a product up on Kickstarter, right? Which was this this pinch salt and yeah. pepper set. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and his whole philosophy, he's built it out a lot bigger than this, and sort of how you frame, like, you know, okay figure out your manufacturing, figure out your audience, figure out your story. He, he gave us a worksheet. Um, and, uh, but he's just, you know, very much a proponent of like getting your stuff up on Kickstarter and just doing it, just like putting it out there, getting the feedback. He's a doer. Yeah. Even, even if it's rejected, it's like, it's a valuable lesson. Like this is a a low cost way of, of figuring out the market. Now, did he talk any a bit any bit about Kickstarter specifically in terms of? I mean, I I think crowdfunding is something I want to experiment with personally. Um, I don't know about Kickstarter as a platform. Did he talk about like Kickstarter as a platform or maybe like just pre-orders on your own website or Indiegogo? Did he talk about any he of that mostly, or no? He mostly talked about about Kickstarter as as a, as the platform. Okay. Um, and I don't want to do any of the talks that I went to, uh, like just justice or not, not justice. I don't know what that term is, but, um, I, I'm not a great reporter, which is why I don't work for 477. <laughs> uh, but basically I, I would say that most of, mostly this, this talk was very much about Kickstarter and like, you know, they've just started like the whole quick starter Oh, idea and that's a two-week kickstarter it's yeah. like a mini kickstarter it wasn't right? started by creighton it was started by somebody else but creighton did one for his uh no commercial value yeah. zine right um but yeah it's it's it was very much a talk about like uh, like how you take a product from an idea to a kickstarter campaign mm. okay. um yeah okay so i was talking to chris ferentz and he, right. he was telling me a little bit i think he was in the same workshop yeah there was a part that he was mentioning about email submissions or something mm. like having on your website, being able to sign up for an email newsletter, even before the Kickstarter even starts. I, I can't see. This is the thing is I went to Creighton Berman's workshop and then I went to Alex Daly's workshop. Oh, okay. And there was a lot of crossover because Creighton Berman then went to Alex Daly's workshop. And so it was really interesting because like, I, w- I went through Creighton's workshop and I actually presented 
something while I was there to talk about an idea. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to talk about my idea because I wanted to give, I had already talked to Creighton before about it. (laughs) I wanted to give other people the floor. Okay. And so I waited and I just sat there. And you know, when you're in those rooms where nobody's going to speak up until somebody starts the Mm -hmm. conversation and Creighton just like looked at me (laughs) and was like, (laughs) <laughs> go ahead please you know and so I, I i spoke about my idea and it got the conversation rolling can you talk about your idea yet or no Not yet. uh i don't want to talk about it yet because okay. i'm i'm planning on no pressure launching something but um but creighton uh creighton then you know we both went to the alex daily um and, and workshop she, and she is also a kickstarter person right is she like yeah a she's, wizard she's on the sort? pr side of things okay Um, so, so yeah, a lot of the conversation, it was, it was very complimentary. You know, she was talking about the great thing about Kickstarter, you know, as, as Creighton pointed out as well, is like the community that you build around a Kickstarter. Like people are personally very, you know, they're, what's the word? They're not just buying your product. They're supporting your entire endeavor to make this product. Yes. So, th- so you form this kind of community around your Kickstarter project. And Alex's talk was very much about how to engage your audience and how to keep engaging them. Because mm. a lot of people will launch a Kickstarter and stop engaging with their community. This like community after they ship, they've built. After they ship, they're just done. Yeah. And apparently, I mean, this is, you know, according to Alex, like email and, and, well, Facebook ads are are really great for for getting people like getting notice. Like Instagram is not actually that good of getting people to like a call to action for getting people to like click and go to oh. websites and like sign up for things. Do you think it's cuz it's mobile? Maybe. And Facebook is more desktop. Right. And so the other thing that she really advocated for was emails and like you know, even before you launch something, getting somebody to sign up, like, you know, go to your website and, and put their email in for, like, a newsletter mm. or any updates. I've heard this a little bit uh, around the web, and a few people have mentioned it to me. This whole email newsletter thing, I never read newsletters at all. Do you have newsletters? I I don't. No, I don't. I, I'm curious. Maybe I should do an Instagram poll this on, is, on this. This is, this is the big quandary is, like... You know that I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I'm always like, am am I representative of the people, like of <laughs> of my audience or of the people that I'm trying to sell to? I don't know. That's you know, a good question. Or am I total oddball that I like ignore newsletters and yeah. you know all that stuff? Because the one thing that is interesting about email newsletters is that email is free and democratic. There's no corporation saying. Oh hey, you know, according to the email algorithm, this email newsletter is going to be at the bottom of the list, and no yeah. one's going to see it. Or hey, we'll put your newsletter at the top of the list. You yeah. know, like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all these things. Email is like the free reign. So if you have an email community, it it would seem like you would have a much more direct contact with your community. Right. Something I want to look into a little bit more because I'm not familiar with it, but. It also seems a little archaic, but I don't know. That's just a thought. Yeah, I just, I don't know when you're in Instagram mode, if you're in the mode of like, I'm going to go and I'm going to sign up for this thing. You know, mm. yeah, I, yeah. there is still like this this difficulty in mobile and mobile websites or mobile anything where you're like, ugh, like, yeah, you know, you wish that you had your laptop out or whatever. Right. But anyway, I hope I didn't misrepresent the talks that I went to and no, no. you know, if These Creighton or Alex are listening and I did send us an email. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I, well, I got a lot, like I, I got a lot of really good information out of those talks. Yeah. And, and hopefully we'll, we'll have a lot of these people on the podcast one day. Yeah. And they Th- that's can, a, that's a hope, you know? Yes. And then I won't have to misrepresent right, them right. without them here. But anyway, Nick, what, what were your talks? Um, I went to, Emily Cohen's workshop, and I believe she is kind of a consultant for consultancies. <laughs> oh, and uh, maybe you could read her bio, but um, yeah, she uh, she even wrote her own book about 
making your own studio. And I think she works a lot with like graphic designers and graphic studios. Mm-hmm. Um, but like she was just, she was, first of all, she talked super fast, but she was just powering through like gold, gold, golds and golds. Look at all these gold coins. <laughs> I'm showing my uh, notes here. There's like four pages of just like tips and tricks that she was powering through for design studios. Yeah. Uh, one of them was that she had this cool graph of, the kind of what you have to do to grow as a studio. So you start out as a freelancer. Uh huh. And when you first start out, you're kind of like a a CAD monkey or a graphic design monkey. You know, you have a client and they're like, hey, I want my ro- logo to be red and out of Comic Sans. And you're like, yes, client, I do what you say, you know? Yeah. It's so like that's the bottom of the line. It's like the service provider. Like you literally just click buttons. And then as you go up, you become more of an advisor, like, oh, hey, client, I know you said you want Comic Sans, but what if we did Helvetica instead? And then you keep going up and up, and, and the next one was strategist, like, hey, so you want your Helvetica logo to be red, but uh, from what I've read and stuff, it seems like blue is actually a more democratic color, and pe- more people like bl- blue because it's you know their favorite color. And you keep going up until you get up to like Innovator, where you're actually like, restructuring the whole company it's you're thinking about the entire design uh design of you know their experience of how you buy a product how it's shipped how you open it up you know how the product looks and feels and really the whole nine yards and you know when you get to that last stage that's where those ideas are you know kind of designing the actual business um and yeah it was kind of interesting to hear that there was this like curve of essentially going from actual design to like more business strategy Mm. in the in the design studio um world but yeah i mean she just like she just like spouted off like a ton of tips um she thought about she like wanted to stress that instead of thinking about getting clients think about curating your relationships so it's Mm. not necessarily like going out and saying hey can i work for you can i can i do products for you it's more about like Oh hey, can I be your friend? And if if you guys are good friends, maybe you can design a product one day. Um, right. Like, again, with the newsletter, she said stay in touch once a quarter, um, which I think I talked about at one of the at one of the podcasts where we were like, I, I was talking about Instagram stories. How every time you show your face on an Instagram story, a person is reminded that you exist. Right. And I kind of feel like that's correlated to like the staying in touch once a quarter thing. Because it's not necessarily like, hey, clients, I need some work. Send me some work. It's more like, hey, clients, here's some projects I've been working on. And it just and the client just so happens that they need a new product. You know? Right. That's cool. Um, some more like tips she had were like providing consequences for a client that is changing the brief. You know, they get halfway through the project and like, oh, hey, I actually talked to my friend. He doesn't like this whole idea and <laughs> which which is fine and it's also happened to me a few times um but i think the way to go about that is like talk to your client be honest and say hey like we can change your idea but it's going to cost this much and going to take this much more time right don't let yourself get run over by a client yeah know? yeah i mean the the thing is is that a client like uh, i think there's this mindset that oh my gosh, I'm not going to say what I honestly think because I could ruin this relationship or lose the project or whatever. But the client is already invested in you and invested in your success, essentially, in the project. So if you're like, listen, this, you know, this is what this is going to, you know, this is what this is going to cost. This is how much more time it's going to take. Like, they see you as the like the expert that they've brought in, the hired gun that they've brought in, they're not just going to dismiss you so easily. Right. And it's even like the sunken cost effect. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's like when you when you spend, like if you were waiting in line at a restaurant that was really good and you waited in line 45 minutes and you're about five minutes away from getting called. Mm. And then they're like, oh, it'll take you five more minutes to wait. And so you're like, okay, I'll wait that. But if you walked up to the counter and they're like, yeah, it's going to be a 50-minute a wait, you'd walk away. 
It's yeah. like that that effect of like you've already spent this much time. Right. You might as well finish it out. Right, right, right. But yeah, her talk was amazing. She also has a book which has I'm sure it's jam packed way more than even that three minute like info that I had. Um yeah, definitely check her out. Uh yeah, I, I enjoyed her talk a lot. Um and then I also uh sat in on T. Chang's workshop and she is a designer and founder of I believe the company's called Crave. Mm-hmm. And they do um vibrators, women's vibrators that look like necklaces. So I, that's a pretty innovative product and pretty out there. We actually try to get her on the podcast too. Maybe she'll come on one day. Um, she was really cool. I got to talk to her a bit. And she talked about how you produce and source your products on Alibaba. Mm. Which, you know, for me, I'm I'm all about that. I've been playing around with Alibaba for a while now. I had my Ben Mir made on Alibaba. And just getting her insight on that was really nice because she really detailed out like her tactics on alibaba she talked about like how she just sent out like 30 30 uh, emails to all these factories that 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 she thought could produce her product and then you know you get like 10 back that say yeah i can produce it and here's how much it costs and then only five of them are actually cost effective and then you get those five to make uh, prototypes of the product samples um, and at that point once you have five factories making samples for you you fly to china which was like that was her advice was, and and this is also kind of throughout the conference i think jamie talked about it and there's a few other people that talked about it of if you want to make great products you have to be one with your your manufacturing you have to go to china you have to right. be at the factory right um which is that's a that's a bold a bold thing to do when you're just like me, one guy. Yeah. With was just living in his bedside apartment. <laughs> yeah. I I mean, I don't know. I'm sure that it makes the back and forth um a lot more efficient in the long run I, is to is to go there, but I don't think that it's absolutely entirely necessary. I don't think it yeah. I mean, I made the Ben Mir and I didn't go to China. Um, I, I will say though, I think I, I definitely understand where everyone's coming from, like being able to sit down and build that relationship. There was a lot of correlations with building great relationships at the conference too. Um, and also like T's product, this mechanical device, vibrating gold necklace is very complex compared to just a stainless steel, like laser cut mirror um so yeah i mean i think it depends on the product as well right and also you don't have to go to china you could have a factory in the u.s or right down the street but is there any equivalent of alibaba in the united states there is american manufacturers there is there's a website called colin um it's it was actually it's pretty recent that it came out uh so i don't know how established it is how is that spelled i think it's c-o-l-i-n colin maybe search manufacturing or something colin kaepernick (laughs) automatic fill um but anyway i don't know i can we can figure out later there's a few but there's really not any um hello colin oh you got it you pulled it up yeah yeah i i I've yet to really find a good source for like m- manufacturing in the U.S. Um, I don't know. We need a we need a pro on that because you and I both are pretty uh, novices when it comes to U.S. Yeah. manufacturing. Yeah, but uh, overall, the conference was just like it was great. It was it was uh, really inspiring. Met a lot of really great people there. Um, I met ZZ Design. Shout out. Uh, very excited to meet to meet him. Great yeah, graphic he, designer. He's a graphic designer. You showed me his work. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean that's that's the other part. That's the other side of the conference because you know we can sit here and tell you bits and pieces about the workshops that we were in, but there's also the experience of going there and and meeting like 
these creatives that are in your community yeah and getting to know them and forming those relationships because there's like you know you learn you learn things in these workshops but you can also form relationships like the relationship that you and I have with one another is very much like a mutual learning relationship. Right. And we like and we met at the first Corey Davis Zam conference. Yeah. Twenty fourteen. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. And you know, like you can you can meet people that are on that same journey that you're on and you're not competing with one another. Like you you probably have very different products that you're pursuing, but there is something to like you know, going on that journey together, comparing notes. And, yeah. You know, curating relationships. Yeah. I thought that was a, that just the way that uh, Emily Cohen formed that sense was good. right. But, but yeah, I, I, you know, hung out with a lot of cool people. Like I said, Creighton Berman was there. I mean, visibility. Oh yeah. Vis- visibility studio. Th- those guys are cool. Um, they're doing a lot awesome work and uh, uh, junk Su park, I believe. Uh, the pixel, oh Museum yeah, of pixelated art. Have we have we shot that one out on the podcast? No, before? we have not. Well, we'll save that. We shouldn't do the shout out yet because that's a good one. But <laughs> <laughs> well, now we already shout it out. Maybe we should shout it out. Should just, we shout that this out? is the shout out episode. We are we are running. Well, we have a few more minutes. Should we answer a question? Nick, don't pay attention to that clock because I started it a long time ago. Okay. But yes, I really enjoyed the conference and shout out to the whole Corsi i 7 team and Emily and Allison and everyone that helped set it up. I set it up. I set it up a little bit. It was amazing. I helped hang posters. And the, and we didn't even talk about the uh, the final keynote. Oh, yeah. What? We almost forgot about it. Uh, what's the what's the name of the of the uh, oh gosh uh, bom- Bompus and Parr? Oh yeah, that was a really interesting, definitely a little bit less design related and more like experience and performance, uh, theatrical. Um, Bompus and Parr, I guess, is a kind of an experience studio. Yeah, like for example, one of the projects they did was made a rock climbing wall covered in chocolate. Mm-hmm. And like chocolate would just pour down the rock face and you could climb up. the. It was like they just do like crazy installations and pieces like that. Yeah, I think the the uh, the way that it tied into the rest of the war of the uh, the conference was very much just like they were just these two guys. And every story that he told Harry Parr was very much like, yeah, we just, you know kind of put these things together we, <laughs> well yeah it's like every story they said oh yeah they were, they were meeting with the client you know like a week before or a month before and they're like oh yeah yeah we can make a rock climbing wall of chocolate no worries no worries and then one day before the conference or before the rock climbing wall they're just like trying to get this chocolate to flow right and then yeah. it explodes and starts running down the hill and you know it's just like they just winged everything right but it always turned out good yeah no, I mean that's it's kind of the hallmark of of somebody who's who is a maker, who is somebody who's starting a creative business. You have to be a bit of a risk taker. That's true. You know, and uh, if you're not, like, you kind of have to like exercise. Uh, we I talk about this all the time of exercising muscles of creativity, but basically, like, if you're if you're not a risk taker, you kind of have to build up to that because. Because all of these creative endeavors, there's going to be an element of risk to them. Yeah, that you have to overcome. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was that was a really interesting talk, and it ended with uh, the uh, what was it? It was they. He took dry ice, put it in a bucket, and then poured boiling water on top. But he also dumped a bottle of gin in too. Yeah. So it created this huge vapor cloud. Filled with gin. Yeah. And so we um, all got drunk just breathing. It was great. We didn't. It was but. wonderful. <laughs> it was actually cool. Um, but yeah, big, big shout out to Core 77. Really great conference. Uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys do next. Yeah, for sure. Um, I Do we have time for questions, James, or no? I don't think we have time for questions. <laughs> okay. <no. laughs> that was a full-on recap. That was a full-on recap. I hope you guys enjoyed that recap. Um, um and then, of course, every week we like to give a shout out of the week. And should we shout out a uh, uh, museum of pixelated art? We gotta uh, search it up here. 
Um, dead air. This is called <laughs> dead air. <laughs> all right. All right. We're shouting out Jung Soo Park this week, and his Instagram handle is Jung, J U N G underscore Sue, S O O underscore Park. And Jung is just, he takes iconic designs and creates pixel art of them and just, you know, puts a little blurb. And the entire, his entire Instagram page is just full of this beautiful pixel art of industrial design. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's um it's so interesting how you can like with iconic design, you can kind of uh bring it down to some really basic elements and still be able to depict the design. Like that's that's kind of the hallmark of iconic design. It that is kind of interesting to think of that as a parameter. Like if you can pixelate your design and it still looks unique, then that means it's iconic. Right. So, huh, that's yeah. Interesting. Big shout out to uh, Jung Soo Park. Keep going. Keep pixelating. Um, yeah, great stuff. Go check it out. Yeah. And, of course, uh, our intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Mm. And we have our Spotify's up there. Whoop. Apple Podcasts, Google Play. Come on. You know, uh, James is on that fire YouTube. You game. got that tubing. Subscribe on YouTube, like on YouTube. Yep. Get to get to some ratings on Apple Podcast. I don't know. Get, do do all of it. Even if you don't even use it, just add those comments in there. Yeah. Um, you know what to do. Yeah. Rate rate like subscribe all that stuff. Um. Yeah. And as always, I'm at Nick P Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. All right. Peace out, guys. Later.